Here it is, number two in our In Focus series finalists. It could only be one of two watchmakers, and it'll be no surprise as to which has come second. It is, of course, Patek Philippe. As well as this video, we're posting articles on our blog at watchfinder.com, which you can check out via the link in the description or the cards that pop up in the top corner. This absolute powerhouse of a watchmaker has somehow made extreme high-end watch collecting a mainstream pastime, beyond all expectations. There aren't many other brands that operate in this price point that are as well known. On that note, here are three things you didn't know about this global icon. Looking to buy, sell or exchange a premium watch? Visit Watchfinder, the pre-owned watch specialist. We're on the road to a million subscribers. Thank you so much to everyone who has already subscribed and to everyone who will in the future. What should we do when we reach that milestone? Let us know in the comments. Did you ever hear the story of Kodak? The industry leader of film photography majorly shot itself in the foot by betting on the wrong horse when it chose to bury its new creation, the digital camera. The story goes that as early as 1975, Kodak engineer Steve Sasson was excited to present an invention that could take pictures without the need of film. Here was an opportunity for Kodak to reinvent the game in a big way, and the company promptly turned the idea down. See, they didn't think of it as an opportunity, more of a threat to the film business it currently dominated, basically self-sabotage. And they stuck with their guns right the way until 2007 with a marketing campaign that stated, and I quote, it's not going to play grab ass with digital. The company filed for bankruptcy five years later. Not exactly the Kodak moment it had hoped for. So you might imagine that a watchmaker as old and as festooned in tradition as Patek Philippe might look at the onward march of digital bristling on the horizon and do the same, digging its heels in deep and taking its pride right the way to its own unnecessarily early grave. Many other watchmakers did just that and now look at them. Except you can't, because they're gone. Yet, somehow, like an old man posting sick memes on TikTok, Patek Philippe rose above the temptation to be conceited and did what any good business in the face of change should do. It innovated. It pivoted, it disrupted, whatever trendy term you want to use, but it did it. In 1956, several decades before the quartz crisis was even a thing, Patek Philippe created the world's first electronic clock. But did senior management at Patek Philippe do what Kodak's did and hide this innovation? No. Instead, the business doubled down on the idea, building precision electronic clocks that found themselves in observatories, broadcast centers, and even nuclear power plants. And these iconic master clock systems, which towered on shelves of polished steel, instead of destroying the company, are actually some of the most collectible Patek Philippe relics available today. How's that for a Kodak moment? At work, there's nothing worse than your boss hovering over your shoulder, backseat driving. Not only does it mean your boss isn't doing their own job, more annoyingly for you, it means you can't do yours properly either. Every move you make is punctuated by a disapproving groan before you even have a chance to demonstrate what you're trying to do. It gets to the point where you want to stand up and scream, well, why don't you do it then? At Patek Philippe, they have this problem from none other than President Thierry Stern. In one very specific circumstance, Mr. Stern will step down from his role as president for a moment just to get embroiled with the watchmakers and tell them how to do their job. This is especially unusual because, despite Patek Philippe being a low-volume manufacturer of high-end watches, it's not exactly a small company. The watchmaker employs some 2,000 people all around the world, with the majority based at its HQ in Geneva, so you'd think it would be a tough ask for the president to find the time to get mixed up in the thick of things. 
It all started in the days of Mr. Stern's grandfather, Henri Stern, when a young Thierry heard a minute repeater complication for the first time. The minute repeater is unlike any other complication in watchmaking today, in that it is still assembled in the traditional fashion. By that I mean where modern manufacture allows components to be crafted to a tolerance where they can be assembled without adjustment, the way a minute repeater works is just too sensitive for that. So the master watchmaker who builds a minute repeater must manually shape and tune the gongs and stroking mechanism to ensure the correct sound is heard. Without this painstaking work, which can take up to 300 hours of literal fine tuning, the repeater can sound dull and discordant, or even not work at all. It's for this reason that Mr. Stern chooses to personally test each and every minute repeater Patek Philippe makes, without a single one shipping to customers until they've had his official sign-off. When you're as old as Patek Philippe, approaching two centuries as it happens, even with all the success and glory the watchmaker enjoys today, that doesn't mean getting this far has been easy. There have been many pitfalls experienced by this old giant, not least of which happened in the 1930s when, basically, nobody was buying what Patek Philippe was selling. We consider Patek Philippe to be one of the greatest wristwatch makers today, but in truth, the company found fame making pocket watches instead. Some of the greatest pocket watches ever made, such as the 1927 Packard with 10 complications, the 1932 Graves with 24 complications, and the 1989 Caliber 89 with a whopping 33, came from the house of Patek Philippe, but that just wasn't enough. Aside from a few very wealthy customers, the general public of the 1930s did not want to buy Patek Philippe's pocket watches anymore. The Great Depression was in its darkest hour, people had no money, and given its successful use in the First World War, the wristwatch was fast on the rise. Patek Philippe had just become irrelevant, obsolete, dunzo. The board of directors at Patek Philippe, in blind panic, tried to sell the business to anyone who'd stand still long enough to hear the pitch, even offering it to one Jacques David Lecoult, who was an administrator for the board. He declined, fancying his own watchmaker, which had just released the Reverso, to be in much better stead. He must have felt a pang of guilt, however, because he did throw Patek Philippe a bone, allowing them to sell the Reverso under its own name. So desperate was Patek Philippe to sell the business that its final buyer wasn't anyone you would expect. Not another watchmaker, nor wealthy enthusiast, or even a cash injection from a government subsidy in exchange for public ownership. The people who bought Patek Philippe and still own it to this day were its dial suppliers. Yes, the company that made the part of the watch most watchmakers can't be bothered with owns Patek Philippe and they probably bought it for a song. Zsuzsa Le Coult must be kicking itself. I hope you enjoyed this video, learning a bit more about this incredible watchmaker, and I hope you enjoy the articles over on watchfinder.com as well. Please do check them out via the link in the description. Make sure you're subscribed for more Patek Philippe facts you didn't know, coming up next time. Discover more exceptional watches at WatchFinder. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. If there are any watches you'd like to see featured, please let us know in the comments below.